Um, I'm really excited to take you to a new frontier for this for the survey, um, and to use a Star Trek analogy, um, you know, where the GSA is going to boldly go. Um, so really, uh, I'm talking about the GOLA Phase 2 project, um, which we've embarked upon and which we'll be undertaking for the next two years or so. Um, and it, it is really a, a, a very big project for us. Now, I want to start and take a bit of a step back to 2019 when um, the department uh, and the geological survey when the Explorers A Gold Challenge uh, through unearthed. Um, the idea there was that we make all the data available, um, as we always do, and then invite data scientists from around the world to work on the data and kind of give us an insight about where the prospective regions are. Now, we asked very, very broad uh, questions and we've learned a lot from it. I think what we learned is some of the things that we need to be much more specific in the questions that we're asking data scientists. Um, but we've, it, the, the upside is that it generates a lot of interest. I mean, we've seen the graph from the Fraser Institute uh, this morning, and I think it's fair to say that uh, such an exercise was very good in the perception of uh, South Australia and attracting investment and just trying new and innovative things. Um, but we still have a long way to go. But fundamentally, the uptake from that is that we have um, received more funding for Gawler Phase 2. Now, the two maps that I'm showing here is we did actually um, pick the top 25 entrants and given these to two companies to review them for us to really understand and dissect, you know, what have we learned from the top 25 entrants. And uh, what they've done is they have produced these heat maps. So heat maps is basically, um, uh, if, you, if you look at the, uh, um, the commodities that uh, the entrants were looking at, so for example, gold or copper, as is shown here, and they basically kind of ask of the top 25, which ones have looked at these commodities? And then basically say, you know, where do they think is a prospective area in the state? And you can plot them all up. And this is what you're going to get. So the warm colors here indicating where uh, a lot of the entrants thought that there's a higher prospective area for copper and for gold. Now you can question each individual entrance and they're obviously based on the data that's been input, but it's still Nice to see that, um, you know, where the prospective areas are. There's obviously known areas that we know about, um, but there's also um, areas that are supposed to be prospective in the northern and western part of the Gola Kratom, for example. So this has given us confidence to, um, well, boldly go into a, one of these frontier areas, and that's the central western Gola Kratom. So you can see the outline there. Um, from the shape uh, around the area that we've chosen, um, so the target area has some existing gold and nickel copper PG deposits in them. Um, so for example, Challenger, Takula, Gulf Bore, Jacinth Ambrosia and Sahara. Um, so there's already some sniffs there, but we know very little about the area. Um, the, one of the upsides as well is that this area doesn't have a lot of cover. So that encourages us, even though there's not very much data out there, if, if there was something to be found, uh, you know, it would inherently be more economical than in a, in a deep cover area. Um, and it has significant data paucity. And I want to show on the next slide really how that looks like. And I'm just going to show it on one data set because I do a lot of MT. I'm going to show you some MT. That's the coverage that we have across the area. Um, the yellow triangles are the MT stations. And you see the Ostlamp MT coverage every 50 kilometers. And you see a couple of profiles, the east, west, and north profile. And that's really all we have. So try to um, imagine using data science where you have maybe discrete drill hole information and you compare it to something like this. It's, it's not really going to be very effective. So we're going to try and uh, address this. Now, the mineral system focus in this area, as I already mentioned, is gold and nickel copper PG. And some of the questions we've been asking is, you know, do metal sediments, for example, at the Challenger Gulf Bore, um, do they have similar sources? Uh, which metasentimentary lithologies are prospective and how widespread are the gold hosting lithologies? And similar questions for the nickel copper PGE deposit. So they're very fundamental, basic questions. Uh, but it really goes to show us that we don't know very much about the area. So based on all that information, um, we went about and thought, well, you know, given the outcomes from the Explorers A challenge, uh, how can we best address you know, marrying the data science and, and the fundamental data. So we subdivided this project into acquisition, data science, and what we call insight. Acquisition is really the bread and butter what the survey has always done. So it's about collecting data and filling those data gaps um, in new search spaces. 
And the data science part is really about future-proofing the delivery of the geoscience data um, to support current and future machine learning and artificial intelligence approaches. And the insight is really, if you bring those two together, you're going to have new insights, and that's insights into the mineral systems in the area. So fundamentally, that's, that's what we're trying to improve, is our understanding of the mineral systems in the central western Gaula Craton. Particular uh, gold, nickel, copper, but maybe there's something else we've, uh, we find. So I'm going to talk about, subdivide the talk next into the acquisition and the data science part. Um, we've started with the acquisition and it's still very much ongoing. Uh, we've undertaken a legacy data capture or will undertake more um, throughout the project. We're gonna talk about a few of the other um, key data sets or regional data sets that we are going to acquire around now. So I wanna show this graph because it's one of the outcomes from um, the Explore SA challenge and really the, the important number is the one down the bottom, the 350 million. It just shows the, uh, just going through the legacy data, I know it's a very boring job, but it, it is fundamentally important in, in adding to the knowledge of, of a particular region. This one really focused on the Gola Craton itself in the De La Marin region, but we see the increases in lithology of rocks, for example, 140% and 10% you know, for drill holes. But really what that equates, if you were to drill all that, um, that would be the value that you have to invest. So looking at legacy data is really important. And because it is uh, such an impactful uh, way to get data into the system, we're going to do it again for the goal of phase two and particularly focusing on this area. So what these graphs on the bottom show is for petrophysics, downhole uh, geochemistry and the drill holes themselves is the blue colors are basically what we have in the database. The pink ones are what we're still gonna have to capture. And you see, especially in the petrophysics, there's still a lot to capture. Um, so there's still a long way to go, but this is what we're trying to do. I'm talking about um, some other things that have already been uh, ongoing. Um, this is a work in process. It's really a, a fairly big project in terms of geochronology and geochemistry. Um, so what uh, a team of geologists from the survey, and I should really shout out to Megan Williams, uh, Anthony Reed, uh, Claire Wade, uh, Mark Pauli, and a few others. They've been in the core library since May um, for weeks, basically going for the entire drill holes that we have available um, across this area in the central West Angola. And the idea here is to really characterize the rocks and you know, I've asked them, what are, what are these the things that you saw just by inspecting the core? Now, what they said is there's a lot of um, hints of bimodal magmat magmatic rocks, um, lots of different mafic suites, uh, which is important for nickel copper, uh, just from cross-cutting relationships. Um, there's a lot more, more late fluid activity um, observed than previously thought, um, and alteration, which is exciting. Um, and some other things are golf ball and you know, challenger are looking quite similar when looking at the rocks. So, so I think that's encouraging just from looking at the core itself. Um, what they've also done, or what the, the idea here is to really um, have another, a, a whole workflow of multi-element geochemistry, uh, then whole rock, some ionium, dimium, and zircon geochronology, and apatite mafic geochronology. So kind of targeting the felsic and the mafic suites at the same time. Um, and to really build up as much of a data redundancy as you can with existing drill holes. But it's, it's really understand the different lipho lithologies um, that are important both for the gold and, and the nickel copper um, mineral systems. Now, just to give you an idea of uh, by how much we have improved it, this is basically the existing uh, data coverage. Down the bottom, you see these for the cores, the geochemistry, geochronology. Um, we actually only have 16 um, multi-element geochemistry log, uh, um, information from cores. So That's very, very little for an area that has two gold deposits within them. Um, and the 44 um, geochronological samples are only from zircons. That's, that's all the information we have. Now, what these guys have done, um, the new data is they basically increased by almost 200% the geochemistry and the um, whole rock semi neodymium samples that have been taken or they're going to be analyzed. So this is work in progress, where hopefully by, um, you know, in a few months time, we'll have these results back. Um, so it's a really strong increase in, in just the sampling across the area. So that's going to be very important to tie in with the geophysical programs. And the two main ones that we're going to embark on is gravity and MT, um, simply because the TMI um, coverage is very good from GCAS, which we've done a few years ago for Pace Copper. We are going to acquire um, over 5,800 gravity stations. 
spaced um, two kilometers apart and we will infill to one kilometer area that is that sort of um, darker stripe there that covers Challenger, but also some of the areas that we think have very high potential for nickel and copper. Um, I think it's currently out for tender. It might have been closing today, I'm not sure. Um, so we'll hopefully embark on that early next year. And likewise for the MT, again, the yellow triangles here are the existing coverage and the black dots are the ones what we are planning to do. So this is a mix of a grid that's a scale reduction of the OSLAMP data. And we're also going to acquire two kind of northwest trending uh, profiles that are going to give us a lot of information across the main sort of northeast trending structures uh, going across and again targeting uh, different types of deposits here. So that's going to be out for tender probably in the next couple of days. Um, so we should also hear something back of um, how we, you know, if this is going ahead in the way we thought um, very, very soon. And both of these, I should say, both of these data sets are going to be collected early next year. And at the same time, we also endeavor to combine all the information that we have from drill holes with the geophysics through a petrophysics program. And we are planning to do that with the CSRO mobile petrophysics lab um, that will analyze all the available diamond drill holes um, from the GP2 area. Now that's the whole suite, um, but that enables us to, um, you know, kind of take or extrapolate some of the um, uh, physical properties of the drill holes out into the geophysics. That's really the underlying idea. Now that's the acquisition. And I just want to highlight a bit more on the data science part. Um, and again, this, the main point here is this build on the Explorer's Egg Oil Challenge. And we've been scratching our heads quite a lot about, you know, what do we take out from, from the challenge? You know, for example, which teams should we choose to kind of look at the data? Um, you know, who are the winners and, you know, what path should we take? But we've actually taken a bit of a step back and, and kind of thought about the best way to to really foster that uh, whole environment is just to build the basics. It's a bit like your iPhone where you just, you know, you produce the iOS and then the applications or the app developers come in. That's the sort of vision that we have. So we're trying to do that with what we call a data stack. Data stack is simply just, um, you know, a, a stack of, of layers of data, um, you know, this raw data and derived data that we're going to collect and, and derive from the raw data itself. But really the focus is here on data standards and um, standardized datum, standardized metadata, so that if someone comes in and looks at the data and interrogates it, they don't have to spend the 80, 90% of time that we and actually the entrance of the Gawler Challenge will have to use to just clean up the data before they start the analysis. So we, we learned that that's really important. The time spent on just cleaning the data is obviously um, a, a huge issue. So we're trying to address that with a data stack. The other thing is how we're going to deliver the data, and that's going to be for web services. Um, so that is really the machine-to-machine -machine direct communication of the data. And again, that should make it easy for the data scientists or anyone really who wants to interrogate the data just to download it without having to wait for packaged up data or contact a geological staff member to do it for them, and that it will take a couple of weeks. Or you know, you, you basically you don't want to do that. So that's what the web services are for. Um, so that we have a feature service for vector data and a coverage service for the rest of data. So that will happen very soon. So to kind of wrap up, and really the next steps are the, the acquisition projects that I talked about, they are ongoing, but we are already planning the next tranche of them. And they are in somewhat uh, more regional projects, but we also want to focus in on some of the areas. And uh, what we so far have in the bag is something like uh, passive seismic, which uh, JP O'Donnell talked about this morning. We would like to roll that over to the western part of the Gola Craton, because we think it's one of the key regional data sets. Anna has just got, gave a brilliant talk um, around, around soil sampling, and so we want to definitely continue that and the geochemistry there. And we are also um, thinking about some high airborne hyperspectral mineral mapping. Um, so here the, the idea is also that we get layers of data that are speaking to different depths, right? So the, the MT speaks really deep, the gravity is sort of in the upper crust, um, but we also have something that looks at the cover. So we really see the entire depth and across the area. That's really important because we think that's the key for data science. I mean, they're going to look at correlations between the data sets, so you need to give them that in order to be successful. And obviously, what I just talked about, the data science, um, we'll continue to, to work on uh, the data stack and the delivery of it. So I might leave it there, and uh, thanks very much for your attention. <laughs>